uh, the Psalms are timeless. Uh, the Medrash says that David Melch said the Psalms about all situations, about all times for Israel. So even though sometimes it seems quite dated, David Melch is talking about, for example, how he ran, once ran away from his son Absalom. So uh, it seems to be restricted to one person uh, praying to God about one particular tribulation from another particular person at one time. Or King David, once again, when he was hiding from Saul in the cave. That seems to be very particular. But really, that which David said is pertinent in many times and places for many people for whatever troubles are coming upon them. Call the Homer when uh, we have the Psalms that are not actually dated or placed or not talking about anyone specifically. A lot of times you have these Psalms, uh, names, national groups, locations are mentioned. Uh, often, those once again, are replaceable. Talking about King David worrying, wondering about his troubles coming from Philistines, uh, we know that that could be easily replaced nowadays with our uh, when we are crying to God about our troubles from the, success, the successors of the Philistines, people whose names sound like Philistines and live in similar places, have similar behaviors, and uh, doing similar behaviors amongst themselves and also toward toward us. So it, it's it's quite obvious. And sometimes... You see that there's a name shows up there, uh, or a group, and it represents a deeper concept. So we'll get into that. Psalm 78, for those who see it, is basically a long review over here, a large part of Jewish history. It's a very long psalm. It has 72 verses. By the way, I'm not so averse to using the no the numbering of the psalms. Why? Because the psalms, the, the they were broken up into psalms by our traditional sources. It wasn't uh, random Christian printers who decided on the chapter numbers, unlike all the other books of the Bible that we use. So this is a, quite a long one. Uh, I was even saying that the, the longest psalm over there, uh, the alphabetical psalm, uh, which one is it? It's uh, Psalm 119, is basically 22 separate psalms. 22 psalms, each of eight verses, and that's why each one is its own paragraph. So you could see it as that. It's funny that we number it as one. But this is one whole psalm. It's one whole uh, parasha. In, if you're writing this in cloth, and it might, it's one of the longer ones, an actual psalm that long. So Psalm 78, 70 sukkim long. Here, Asaf is uh, basically giving his review of Jewish history as it led up to his own time. He's saying that Am Yisrael uh, did not learn their lessons. Why? Because they had lived through the Exodus and all of its attendant miracles. But for whatever reason, that generation of the wilderness... Uh, had sometimes, uh, I guess, I, I wouldn't say this, if the Torah didn't say it, if the psalm didn't say it, I wouldn't have said it about them because they're held to such a high standard. God has special, especially high standards for those who are closest to him. But it says that they refused to learn a lesson and were, did not have an appropriate amount of trust. And it continued through the times of the judges. And he mentions that we have to look at the B'nai Ephraim. He says you shouldn't be uh, like the previous generations, learn this lesson now, or it could be like the B'nai Ephraim knows K Rome Keshet of Hubion Croft. The B'nai Ephraim lost out big. And he, he mentions once again Shevet Yosef uh, and Ol Yosef and B'nai Ephraim at the end of the psalm when he's discussing the destruction of Shiloh. In this case, B'nai Ephraim represents, by the way, there's, uh, I'm just for this particular Pirush that we're going with, B'nai Ephraim represents the old regime. What do I mean by the old regime? Uh, this is an idea that gave rise to our Jewish concept of Mashiach ben Yosef and Mashiach ben David. There is going to be a Davidic Messiah, and that will be the ultimate Messiah. He's going to bring about the rebuilding of the temple. In his days, everything will finally be as we've been waiting for. And Mashiach ben Yosef apparently is also uh, a Messiah-like figure who will rise and accomplish many great things, but not bring about the ultimate, uh, the ultimate redemption. Where does this come from? The the models of Joshua and David, which you saw, like Maimonides brings the two model kings. You learn more from Joshua than you do from King David. So in Joshua's days, the Jewish people conquered the land of Israel very quickly, as a matter of fact, and settled the land of Israel and built the temple. And, oh, welcome. Sorry, there's no pizza here, but you're late. That's okay. It's back home. We have like two whole pizzas if you want. Oh, yeah. Okay. No, Come on. So uh, let's just talk about Ephraim. Where are the B'nai Ephraim in Psalm 78? So that means that's talking about the old regime. Yeshua was from Shevet Ephraim. 
he built the temple in, in, in the land of Israel. The Mishkan Shilu was 100% temple, although it was not permanent. That is, it wasn't chosen by God forever. Just like Ephraim, just like Shevet Ephraim and its leader were chosen by God. Yeshua was the one that God had said he should be the one to conquer the land of Israel. Zaro Yel Melo But it didn't stay in Yeshua's family forever. The tribe of Ephraim was the dominant tribe of Israel. And combined, the Shevet Yosef was the largest tribe in Israel by quite a few thousand people at the end of Moshe Rabbeinu's time and at the beginning of the time of the judges. So they were the dominant tribe until basically the destruction of Shiloh. Even though, yes, it says that Yehuda had to go first when they had the post-Joshua wars, it says uh, the people asked, so who's going to lead more wars? They said, Yehuda Yaleh. And the first judge came from which Shevet? Yehuda. That was Othniel ben Kenaz. But the tribe of Ephraim was still the dominant tribe. Uh, uh, I remember uh, the tour guide took everybody to Old Shiloh. He was asking the children, where was Israel's capital? Before Jerusalem was the capital of Israel, where was Israel's capital? Shiloh. Okay. That's where they that's where we went on pilgrimage. That's where God had the Hashrat Shina. Shiloh was in Ephraim's territory. Yes, there is an opinion in Chazal, mentioned in Zvachim, that Shiloh was also somehow in Binyamin's territory because the, the Mikdash always has to be in Binyamin's territory. So Novin Givon, that's an Eretz Binyamin. And the northern side of Jerusalem, apparently the border between Yehud and Binyamin, goes right across the Temple Mount. And the and the temple edifice stood in Shevet Binyamin's part of Yerushalayim. That's true. But then they're confronted with the problem. Shiloh is basically right in the middle of the land of Ephraim. Now, how, how do you get the Eretz Binyamin ends just north of here? Like we said, by the time you get to Beit El, you've already crossed into Eretz Ephraim. So how do you how do you somehow do this? They say it must be that there's a, a strip of land that goes up Route 60 all the way to Shiloh. That's not Pshat. That's not the majority opinion. The, the, the main opinion in the Talmud is that the God chose Shiloh in the land of Ephraim before he revealed Jerusalem to everybody, and it has nothing to do with Binyamin's land. It's not there. Ben Ketef Av means that the permanent temple would be in Jerusalem, in uh, Binyamin's territory. So Bnei Ephraim represents the old regime. And by the way, it's been pointed out by Mepharshim, which is why when Gidon Ben Yoash, who was from Shevet Menashe, led a successful campaign, became the leader of Am Yisrael, and did what he did, Bnei Ephraim took offense at what he was doing. You know, we're, you're, you're taking too much of our authority. So too, Yiftach, who was around, uh, I guess, uh, almost a, the better part of a century later. He's one of the later judges. He was the last major judge before Shimshon. And also he became, he right before he had his battle with uh, with Amon, that was the basic, the people he was fighting, it says the Philistines already started conquering the land of Israel and taking over. He, you know, Yiftach was in Avar Yarde. What was going on, on the west side was not basically in his territory. But even then, Shevet Ephraim also was upset about what Yiftach was doing. They were chafing. They felt that they they were the dominant tribe and leadership should come from them. So that's what the, the, the psalmist is talking about over here, that the way the, the people were in the time of the judges, they had too many, uh, I guess, too many periods of idol worship. Right, that's what happened in the time of judges. It says they would become bad, they would start serving idols, and then God would save them. Eventually, it says here that God had enough of it. The people had back had slid back too far, and they deserved the Qurban. That's basically what Shmuel Navi came and told them. There was a corruption in the priesthood, there's corruption in the leadership, the people are worshiping idols too much. They're even treating the Ark of the Covenant like an idol. So they're going to have their temple destroyed and they're going to suffer uh, a great defeat. Why the old regime is declining and in need of replacement. And that's why the psalm continues and concludes that God rejected eventually the Yosef regime. The Yosef regime re represented by Mishkan Shilo and the leadership of uh, big-time Ephraimites. And instead, it says he chose King David and Jerusalem. New, 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 uh, new rulers. The, the act of God choosing King David's line and Jerusalem, they go hand in hand. Jerusalem is only the legitimate seat of the Davidic monarchy. And the Davidic monarchy is the only group that could rule in Jerusalem. They go hand in hand. So that was what was established at this point. That's basically the, the first our idea of what Mashiach is supposed to be follows the Davidic model. By the way, I just saw two two rabbis arguing about this right, right before Marv. 
someone, the, this rabbi was saying, a very Haredi idea, that when Mashiach comes, everybody will recognize him right away. It'll be clear to everybody it's Mashiach. Right? That's what's going to happen, right? That's what we believe. And the problem is, one, if you look in the Rambam, for example, that's going to be a little bit difficult because nowadays, like we said last week, if anybody were to come along and say, hi, I'm Mashiach, I'd like to try to build a temple, what would the chief rabbis tell him? You're not allowed to go. You're, you're not allowed to try to build a temple. They'll test him. They'll test him. How? Yeah, they, they, I don't know. I don't know. They, they, they won't do it. Just Yeah, I know. I, I was just using them as an, as an example. We've set it up that no one can try to be Mashiach unless he can have do like real magic and just say like he could raise his hands and all the bad guys would drop dead in front of him and a temple would fall out of the heavens. He wouldn't have to do anything. Just sit back and which is, by the way, there is no historical precedent for such a thing. I, I like to tell people, if you want to know what's going to happen, look at what has happened. Right? When God has sent us Messiah-like figures, who are Messiah-like figures so far in history? People whom God chose to lead the people. They were always rejected before being before really showing to everybody. So let's give an example. The first of God's rejects was Moses. Right? People came to him and they said, no, you've just made it worse. Yeah, okay, he was able to recover quickly. God allowed him to do miracles in the whole Exodus. But even after that, how how accepting of Moses' word were the people? How many major rebellions did they have? What? Well, it says in, it says in it's an explicit Pasuk in Bamidbar, and it's also an explicit Mishnah. Ten times. Why na suo thi zeh neser prami. And it says in Perkyavos, our ancestors tested God. By, by the way, challenging Moses ten times in the desert. So the question is, where are the ten times? And by the way, when God says that the, the ten times up were up to the time of the spies. And Korach is mentioned afterwards. So let's say, even that was a test, I guess, eleven times technically. Or maybe you could say the Korach thing happened beforehand. We're, we'll discuss that when, uh, when we get to there. Uh, the point is, Moses didn't exactly have an easy time being accepted by the people. And no, no one's more of a Messiah figure than he was. Or a savior. When King David showed up, also, right, he had the old regime was basically trying to kill him. Yeah, and even then he had he had rebellions. He had two major rebellions while he while he was king. What happened when Saul was chosen? The first thing people said about him, that guy. Hmm. What? That's it. God chose a king. What's he going to do? It says he went home. Saul was king, so a few people gave him tribute, you know, and then he went back to his farm like everybody else until a war started. And, you know, he was busy plowing and like, oh, I guess I'm king. So everybody's going to have to go out and fight with me. So uh, on the contrary, I think that if the Messiah, the future Messiah, may he may he be revealed soon. And I hope he starts doing something now because they say there's a there's a false Mashiach around. Everybody claims this guy, he's a Mashiach. Say, if he's a, go, go right ahead. You know, I'm very happy if he is the Mashiach, let him do Mashiach things. But he hasn't done anything like that. None of these false messiahs until this point have done such a thing. But I'm very, I'm very open to someone taking, you know, taking this the, the place of the rightful messiah. Either way, he's going to be rejected. I, I think that you know we have to be a lot, lot more realistic. We have to allow for proper Jewish leadership. If a leader arises, he doesn't necessarily have to be one of the rabbanim. By the way, Rabbi Akiva, his idea of a messiah was a political, military leader, right? Bar Kokhba wasn't one of the chachamim. Yes, Rabbi Akiva was wrong because he saw Bar Kokhba fail, failed. But there was a Havamina there. So too, the future Messiah will fit that mold. And, and uh, yeah, that's why I think, study your Psalms, read Psalm 78. It's basically telling us that the old regime sometimes has to go because it's holding back the Davidic regime. Doesn't mean anything, the re regime didn't do anything wrong. Lama de Vardomet, the B'nai Ephraim mentioned in this Psalm might be talking about the first generation of leaders in the state of Israel, the ones who were able to accomplish establishing a state, conquering the land, building a country, building Yishuvim, up until recent times. Now, it, the, the, basically the pattern has been with Israel's wars is that they don't want to win. They cannot win. They don't, have, they don't have a will to win, and they're slowly losing. And the rate of their losses is increasing, which is how we began this evening. So we pray that uh, we live to see destruction of all of Israel's enemies 